Hello, I'm Laura Ackerman, Disability Services Coordinator for Ohio Agribility and OSU Extension. Welcome to Farm Science Review 2020 Online and Gardening Across the Ages. Ohio Agribility's mission is to promote success in agriculture for Ohio's farmers and farm families who are coping with disability or a long-term health condition. Ohio Agribility provides education and resources to farmers, agricultural businesses and groups, healthcare, education and disability professionals, and anyone interested in making farming safe and accessible. Our website is agrability.osu.edu. That's spelled A-G-R-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y dot O-S-U dot E-D-U. So gardening is exercise. You should stretch before, during, and after you work in the garden. We do have more stretching resources available at the end of the presentation. I'm gonna show you a short video right now that shows some of the stretches from our Fitness for Farm Life program. I'll have information about that at the end of the program too. Here's my husband, he's doing a chest stretch. Just put your head, your hands up behind your neck, behind your head and push back. Just push your elbows back. Here's Andrew. He is leaning over and doing a side bend. So you just reach your head up over and you lean as far as you can. Run your opposite hand down your thigh to help with a little bit of balance. Switch to the other side. And you can do this sitting, standing, wherever. You can do it at your desk. You don't have to do this, but make sure you're stretching when you're in the garden. Here's Andrew again doing a way back. It's called a way back. You put your hands up over your head and you lean back like you're gonna do a back bend. And then you lean back forward and you try to touch your toes, get as close as you can. Just all of these stretches, make sure you don't bounce, trying to get yourself into a deep, deeper stretch and hold it for 10 or 20 seconds. What's comfortable? Here I've got Leah's father. He's doing a calf stretch. He's just lifting his feet up. And if you try that, it's surprising how much stretch you feel in your calf. All he's doing is lifting his feet up, has his heels on the floor. I believe this is Leah's sister. She's doing a hamstring stretch. She's got one knee bent, the other leg pushed out in front of her, and she's leaning down with her hands on the outstretched leg, and you can feel a stretch up here in, a, in your leg there. So those are just a few of our Fitness for Farm Life stretches. We also have a handout called Don't Let the Dirt Hurt. It's on our website, and I'll have that information at the end of this presentation. Keep trying to stretch. So when we talk about gardening, you may not think of safety, but I want you to think of safety first. Um, before you go outside, we had already talked about medication sensitivity and safety. Please be aware of sensitivities or reactions you might get from being outside or being in the sun or the hot or the cold. Um, but also protect yourself from the sun. Wear a sun hat, wear sunglasses, sunscreen. I've got a picture here of a very pretty off-white sun hat with an orange uh, tie around it and tied into a bow and some nice dark sunglasses. Always have your phone with you. Whenever I do this presentation in person, almost every time I hear a story from the audience about that person or someone that they know or someone who knows someone they know who had a terrible fall. Maybe they were just walking out the back deck and walking down the steps. Steps were slippery. They slid, broke a leg or something were out. Um, I know one lady was out, her neighbor was out in the lawn, slipped on walnuts and broke her hip and was there for a while because nobody knew where she was. So a couple things, um, always have your phone with you and have it someplace that you can access it. Um, you, you obviously never plan to fall and you don't know if you're gonna fall on the side where you hold your phone, but have your phone with you. It'll give you the option to call someone. And if you do fall and you can't get up, please call someone. You're not being an inconvenience. Please call. One other thing to say is wear hearing protection. We may not think about it. And you may think, well, as I get older, I'm going to lose my hearing. Yes, but you don't want to rush that process. So some nice ones like these earmuffs. Um, they're not the fluffy earmuffs you wear during the winter, but these are some big headphones and they have a 
there's you want to look for noise reduction rating when you're buying some hearing protection which indicates how many decibels the product lowers a noisy environment and a noise reduction rating of 20 is typically adequate for gardening activities so think about that before you go out and garden running the rototiller the lawnmower weed whacker leaf blower those things are really really loud Next thing in our safety first is we're gonna talk about preventing slips, trips, and falls, which I just did. But a little further on that, be aware of your environment. Wet grass, wet steps, tools left out in the garden or a hose that you could trip over. Clean up those things and be aware of your environment and careful where you walk. Wear comfortable and good fitting shoes with non-slippery soles. I will admit that I wear sandals all year round unless there's snow on the ground. And for the most part, they fit me pretty well, but every now and then, I don't know, something happens and I just kind of kick them off as I walk. And sometimes I'll trip, so be careful. Don't be like me. Um, you also want two to three points of contact on stairs and equipment. And here she's showing that she's getting on a lawn tractor. You'll see that she does have three points of contact. Her left hand is on the steering wheel. Her right hand is on the back of the lawn tractor seat and her left foot is up on the running board. Um, clearly she's going to have to move her right hand when she swings her leg over to put to sit on the seat but climbing up onto it she's still going to keep the left hand on that wheel and you always want to have something when you're coming down the steps have your hands on a handrail and try to be careful try not to carry too many things when you go up and down steps. Next, I've got a couple of videos here. Um, on the left side, we've got our, our lawn per our, I believe that's Cheyenne, I hope that's Cheyenne, uh, climbing up onto that tractor, it's my boss's daughter. So she's gonna do this not the safe way, she just hops right up on there. Maybe eventually, I think she reaches up and grabs onto the steering wheel, but she could have, to do this safely, could have reached up and grabbed the handrail that's on the, over the back, over the fender of the big back tire before she put her foot on the footrest or before she put her foot on the first step and climbed in. But she pretty much just goes up, grabs that steering wheel, goes in. And believe me, I did actually slow this video down and make it easier to see. She's still really fast. So she goes up, steps up, leans forward, then just kind of jumps forward and grabs onto that steering wheel and then climbs in. She could have should have grabbed the handrail with her right hand and possibly um, the arm of that, I can't tell if it's a plow or some, whatever that is on the left side, but she just jumped up, stepped on it and grabbed the steering wheel. That's not the way we want to do it. And so she's going to do it the right way over here on this lawn tractor on the right picture. Comes out, hand on the steering wheel, seat, hand on the back of the seat and actually just steps over. So she keeps her right hand on the seat even while she steps over and sits down on it. I apologize for the blurry videos, but I think you can still see what was going on there. So next we're gonna talk about safe lifting. And you may think, I don't lift anything that's that awfully heavy when I'm gardening. Well, I do want to rethink that. Um, bags of mulch, bags of soil, those are heavy. If you had a big bin full of pots or tools or something, you pick up a lot of things that are heavier than you think they are. So you probably have heard the phrase, lift with your back, not, sorry, I did it wrong. Lift with your legs, not your back. So I'd heard that before and I thought I knew what it meant, but until I went through Fitness for, for Farm Life with Leah and Andrew and saw them actually demonstrating safe lifting, I didn't really know what that meant. So to lift something safely, you want to have a wide stance. Your feet should be shoulder width apart with your head in a neutral position over your shoulders. And a neutral position means your head's pretty much centered over your shoulders, over your neck. It's not jutted forward. It's not side to side. It's just comfortable where you would be standing where your head's at a comfortable position, not leaning forward. You want to keep the object you're lifting close and in line with your nose and your toes. You do not want to twist. You don't want to have your good wide stance, squat down, pick it up, stand up and twist your back because you could throw your back out. Your nose and toes need to stay in line. And if your nose and toes are in line, so will your torso. 
where you're holding that object close to you. You're going to bend at your legs, not your back, whether that means you squat down, you kneel down, crouch down, whatever it is, don't just stand there and bend over at your waist. You're going to hurt your back. Use your stomach muscles and breathe out. So you crouch down, you're picking up that heavy bag of potting soil, you pulled it up close to you. Don't just relax your stomach, you wanna breathe out, which causes us to engage our stomach muscles, which also kind of firms up your back. And then you wanna use the strongest part of your body, which is your legs, and you're gonna lift it. And I'm gonna show you a video right now of Leah and her brother showing us good and bad lifting. So he comes in, he crouches down, grabs that with both hands, picks it up with his legs, back engaged, and goes and nose and toes, follow him. Here he's doing it wrong way. He's leaning over at his waist, picking up those logs, and just twisting and flinging them up on the table, which he may not have hurt himself, but that's a way to hurt yourself later. Leah just leaned down at her back, picked up that heavy battery, and now she's going to do it right. She comes in, kneels down and braces herself against the table with her right hand, picks the battery up with her left hand, holds it close to her, nose and toes follow her to the table. And there she's doing it again. Good job, Leah. And then she just picked it up and put it back down. So think about that when you're lifting things. Even if they're things that aren't that heavy, you can still give your back a good hard twist when you're just picking up something lightweight off the floor. So nose and toes, remember that. Next, we're gonna talk about universal design, which is the creation of products and environments meant to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without need for adaptation and specialization. The reason we're talking about this is universal design, you might've heard of universal design for learning, but it came out of architecture. And one of the best examples I can think of is a ramp or a curb cut. So a ramp going into a building so that a person who uses a wheelchair can get into the building. But not only people with wheelchairs use ramps, people who have strollers, people who are delivering cases and cases of water or soda or heavy items, they use the ramps also. So that is universal design. When it was made but is specifically mandated legally for a person with a wheelchair, but a lot of people benefit from it. So I want you to think about universal design when you're designing your garden, if you're doing any updates to your garden. And a lot of universal design, it's not difficult. It doesn't have to be. It's just the way you set things up. So here I've got, oh, too far. Here I've got some pictures. On the top picture, I've got my husband. This is, a, all these are at Franklin Park Conservatory in Columbus, Ohio, which you've never been there, you need to go. It is spectacular. These are the outdoor gardens at Franklin Park. And the top, my husband's sitting on a nice shady bench. Um, and that's part of universal design, having places that you can sit down. Anybody can sit on that bench. But I also want to call out one thing. If, um, if a person, I was speaking to a garden manager a few years ago at another conservatory botanical garden and they were planning a new garden and he was showing me the plans and I said well this is terrific and there was like in this picture on the far right we've got a nice grape arbor and it's got a wide sidewalk under it it's very shady this was a really really hot humid day uh, I think early September it was hot it was humid and just walking under that grape arbor really made a big difference so he was showing me his plans and here's our shade. And I said, well, where does the person with the wheelchair, how can they get into the shade? Oh, we don't have room for them. You need to make room for them because everybody likes some shade. So the universal design features that I would show you in the, the picture where Barack is sitting, it's a smooth pathway. You can get up to it and sit on that bench and it's under shade. Person in a wheelchair will not be able to get on that bench easily or at all. And there's really no place for them right there under the shade. So it's not perfect, but it's still a really nice thing to have seating. The big picture of the grape arbor, there's a nice wide sidewalk. You could get under there if you needed to, if you needed some shade, you could sit under there. It's very picturesque. When the wind blows through it, it's just beautiful. You can also see that they have paved sidewalks through here. They're wide. And in 2020, it's very important to have social distance so we can stay away from each other. Um, we can give each other some room. So you can kind of see on the left of the grape arbor picture, there's a lot of seating. They have a big kind of pavilion area with tables and chairs all through there. 
and some more gardens. And so they've got things spaced out well enough so that you could socially distance, which also helps a person in a wheelchair. You need at least a 36 inch wide path to get a wheelchair through or a scooter. Some strollers seem like they're bigger than that. So you may be thinking, well, I don't, you know, if I'm planning my public garden or my semi-public garden, I don't ever see people in wheelchairs here. Well, that may be self-fulfilling because they may not be able to go. If you've got grass, really big gravel paths, things that are hard to, to traverse, they may not even go because they can't. But in addition to the people who use wheelchairs and making it accessible to do this, we have plenty of people who have walkers, people who use canes, people who just walk a little bit slower, maybe have stiff knees or hips and would really appreciate a nice smooth path, whether it's gravel, very small gravel or paved or a nice dirt path that's really smooth and wide. So think about that. But here we have a kind of a big plaza. It's got gray stone, square, gray, square gray stones, and then it's got, those are outlined with red bricks. On the left side, we have pots of pink flowers, and it looks like maybe some, not sure if that's bamboo, but a lot of foliage, a really beautiful stone fountain with a wall, and it's covered with white flowers. And on the other side, we have the pink, potted pink flowers again and some more foliage, and that's in front of a big tree and a building with red bricks. So we've talked about universal design, but let's also talk some about strategies for, for gardeners or family members or friends with memory or cognitive issues. It's one of the unfortunate facts of life as we get older, we might have some memory problems, there might be some cognitive issues, but those are not reasons to, for people to stop gardening. Um, they're, they are reasons for that person or their friends and family to maybe be a little more careful with the gardening things. First thing I say is label everything. Tools, chemicals, equipment, plants. Um, part of it is if you, I, I'm a, I love to organize stuff. I love to put labels on things so I know how to put them back. So if you invite a friend in to help you in the garden, they know where to find the tools, where to put them back. I cannot stress strongly enough how important it is to keep chemicals labeled so you know what they are. If someone spills or sprays chemical on themselves, they need to be able to look up that safety sheet to see how do I treat that? Do I, can I just rinse it with water or is it something more serious? And if you're mixing up chemicals or anything and putting them in another bottle that doesn't have a label on it, you absolutely need to mark on that bottle what those things are. You should label equipment and plants. And I say that because again, you might invite people to come in who don't know your garden, aren't familiar with it, but also for your uh, friends and family who might have a memory or cognitive issue, they can be a lot more independent if they know what the tool is, where it's called, where it goes, if they know what the equipment and plants are called. Gardening can help with stress, anxiety, motor skills. It can keep all of those things at a healthier level. You all know how relaxing it is to go out and garden. Think about if someone has a memory or a cognitive issue. I think a lot of things in life would just be heightened stressors. So the garden, if they can go out and just help you in the garden or continue their own garden, that's gonna help a lot. Working in the garden can, together can build connections between people. You all know that. Um, right now we're trying really hard to stay away from each other, but you could still, this also at the same time, people are, build, are planting victory gardens. So it's a lot of fun. You go out learning a lot, of pe learning a lot about gardens. Um, try to use plants that encourage wildlife, such as birds, butterflies. These can also trigger memories and provide visual stimulus, as well as they're good for the environment. They're fun and pretty to look at. If you do have a garden path, it should, as far as possible, always return to the house. So if you're designing a path within the garden, try to avoid abrupt changes and dead ends, make smooth curves, but don't just have a dead end because that could be very confusing for someone to go and then they'd have to find their way back out. So try to keep a continuous path and ideally it should always return to the house. If someone's wandering, it's easier for them to find their way back. 
So some universal design tools and equipment. Um, this is for inside the house and also for your garden. If you have a garden shed, a garden gate, lever style doors, gate handles, and water faucets. Those are nice because you could hit those with the, you don't have to use your fingers and use the fine motor and have a grip. You can hit it with the side of your, with the side of your hand, or you can honestly even hit it with your forearm or your elbow to make it open, to make it close. That's helpful if you don't have a strong grip or if arthritis has given you some trouble with making a grip or holding things. And also if your hands are full, you can just hit that with your arm and open your door, your gate. And then the water faucet, I have one of the water faucets, it's on the side of the of our building and it has a wheel. And inevitably, you know, the first time you go out and you'd start the water faucet, your hands are probably dry, <clears throat> easy to turn or not. But when you come back, your hands are wet because you've done some weeding or you've gotten water on your hands. Those things are hard and I don't have arthritis in my hands and it's hard for me to turn. And I keep saying I'm gonna get a lever, one of these years I will. Also soaker hoses are really nice. Like I was saying this summer, there were some days that it was so hot, it was all I could do to go out and water. I have a lot of soaker hoses, but I did not get around to laying them out before the garden was totally grown in. I love the collapsible hoses. You can see on the slide that in the far right, I have a green, it's called a bungee hose. They're these super soft ones that kind of collapse and bungee up on themselves, and they are so lightweight. We also have one of the big heavy rubber hoses that I think I may have finally convinced my husband after 12 years to get rid of it because he was the only one that would use it and it was so bulky to get it out and so heavy and so hard to wind up and unwind. I love these bungee hoses. I think I have four or five of them. And attached to the bungee hose, you might be able to tell I have one of those trigger guns. And actually I have a picture on here of a yellow and gray um, trigger, hose trigger. I don't know, hose sprayer. It's nice because you can squeeze the handle and there's a little lever that you can flip that locks it on so you're not standing and squeezing it. Because over this summer it was taking me 30 to 40 minutes to water my garden and I don't have a very big garden. But not having to squeeze your hand that whole time really makes a difference. I also like these, um, these hose sprayers because they have different uh, mist, a spray, a soaker, a jet, etc. A lot of different spray patterns. I'd already mentioned the faucet with the lever handle. We have a picture of a brass colored one here and it has a lever that comes off of it. All of, all of these things that I'm mentioning, all these tools and pieces of equipment, we have a handout called the Garden Tools Equipment Handout. Um, it's listed on our website and go and look at that. I will tell you, I do not get any money. I'm not endorsing any product. I don't get any money for suggesting any of them. I just know if someone tells me about a product, I need to write it down or look it up immediately or I forget it. So this is just a reference sheet for you to go back next time you wanna get a new tool or something and to look and think, hey, that's that thing that she talked about. I think I'll try that one out. Next picture on the slide is, it looks like a big wooden chest. It's actually a very sturdy plastic trunk. You open that up and inside it, typically there are maybe some shelves or some bins that you can store stuff but it's a really sturdy plastic that's meant to stay outside. So you could leave that out in your garden. You could not only sit on it, you can store stuff in it. I've also seen bins like this that are a little bit bigger, maybe um, I think they're called like pool cabinets or something, but they're pretty big and they have do like two doors, kind of French doors that open, but they'll have a thing where you can lock it. So if you could put something like that out, if you don't have a garden shed, if you could put that out near your garden, you could store a lot of equipment and tools out there and you wouldn't have to carry them back and forth between your garage or your shed or wherever you store them. And the last thing I have on here is a rolling work seat. I'm gonna talk about these in a little bit, but this is a really nice black one. It has four really thick wide tires. It has a basket in the front of it. It has um, kind of a long, base to it that has a basket underneath it where you can put things in and then it has um, a swiveling work seat that's padded. The seat is padded and it also has a padded backrest. It doesn't go full length backrest but it would at least hit your lower back and if you can tell on it it's got loops around it like a tool belt so you could pop some of your tools in there, put a couple bottles of water in, whatever else you need and then my very favorite thing about this work seat is that black handle that comes up off of it. It's like the handle you'd have for your little red wagon. 
and I'll tell you why in a couple slides why I think those are so important. We have a little red, very cute little red worksheet that does not have that handle and there's not much, it's not very useful. So next I want to talk about saving your fingers. Um, these are, your hands can get arthritic, your, your fingers can wear out, it can be a little harder to do the work. So when we talk about this, avoid repetitive use of your fingers. So I had just mentioned holding the spray nozzle, the sprayer on the um, hose open for 45 minutes, squeezing it. It really puts a strain on your hand. So we have that little lever where you, you still have to hold it, but you don't have to grip it and squeeze it, and that's nice. So avoid repetitive use of your fingers. That could be um, pruning, using the loppers, spraying if you do a lot of spritzing with a bottle. But just if you have to do that, switch hands back and forth. Unless it needs a lot of really, really fine motor skills, you might be able to do the kind of the bigger gross motor skills with your non-dominant hand and give your dominant hand a break. You want to keep your hand in a neutral hand position where if you're just look down and see where you're sitting right now. If you're just sitting maybe with your hands in front of you or hanging off to the side, your thumbs should be facing forward. Um, the back of your hands would be fit would be pointing out to your sides. So they'd be and then your palms would be facing into your sides. I've got a little video here that's going to demonstrate a good neutral hand position and she's also going to show some very exaggerated ways to hold a tool and not hold a tool. But last, I want to talk about grippy gloves to hold tools without exerting your hands and wrists, and also using tools with spring action designed to reduce hand strain. So the grippy gloves, they're on that tool handout that I talked about. And what they look like is, it looks like a regular glove, and the palm of it is kind of a pebbly, I don't think they're real leather, kind of a, a textured, um, pleather or faux leather. So it's got some grip to it, it's not slick. The back of the hand on these, um, there's a longer strap that's attached to the top of like where your wrist is. It's attached there and it has the hook side of hook and loop tape. Or I might be wrong, it might be the loop side. But basically Velcro on the inside of the whole strap. And then on the inside of your, of your wrist is um, the other side of Velcro. And so what you do is you take this strap, you put the glove on, you put a tool in your hand, um, and it needs to be a tool that you're going to hold for a while, not when you're going to pick up, put down, pick up, put down. Um, but let's say you're going to be doing a little bit of shoveling and digging. So you're holding the tool in your hand, and you're not holding it tight. You've got kind of a loose grip. Your hand is holding it in place, but you're not gripping it. You take that long strap, you pull it up over your hand, across your fingers, and you secure it at the base of your wrist. So you're basically kind of um, wrapping your hand up with this long strap, and that will help you hold that tool in your hand without you putting the effort in to hold it. I hope that made sense. And now I've got a short video to show you about neutral hand position. Oh, pause. So she's holding the tool, she's just holding it straight out so the thumb is on top of the trowel. And then she's kind of twisting her wrist right now. So it looks like it's a little exaggerated twist down. And then she's twisting it really hard out so that the back of her hand is out, holding it down, putting her finger over the top of it. The way you want to hold it is your thumb over the top of the handle. Like your, your thumb would be pointing towards the sky if you gave a thumbs up. And then you just grip it in a relaxed way to hold it. She's also picking up some little clippers here. I think these might have spring action design but she's squeezing those to show that um, you don't need, with the spring action design, you don't need a lot of effort to squeeze the tool, which is really nice. The tool does the work, not your hand. So we also want to protect your elbows and shoulders from damage caused by excessive twisting and reaching. So minimize working with your hands above your shoulders when you can. Um, try to limit lifting, reaching, and pulling. And one way to do that is with long handled tools, which can minimize the need to reach or stoop. And then also remind you to stretch. I've got a video here of uh, somebody at, Farmer, at Franklin Park Conservatory standing in front of a red brick building with the white doors and at the edge of a big bed of flowers and plants. 
and she has a hose and it's attached to a long water wand. So she's just holding it lightly near the back, say quarter of the wand and it's reaching pretty far out into that bed. She doesn't have to walk all the way out into it. She doesn't have to lean over and she's just watering. And she's note that she's got on her sun hat, sunglasses and a mask and some good sandals that look comfortable and are strapped on really well so they're not gonna fall off. But it's, it's not a lot of effort. She just has to hold that water wand. She's got her hands at a pretty neutral position and it doesn't cause her to be reaching out, trying to reach the middle of that bed. So I had mentioned hauling equipment and supplies. So tips for choosing the right cart or wheelbarrow. Um, you wanna consider the weight of the cart and the cargo and you want to look for carts or wheelbarrows with removable back or front panels and large tires. So when you're doing that I've got a picture of four different two work seats and two carts on here. So the first one on my far left is the black work seat that I had described before. It's a rolling work seat with padded seat and backrest, a long handle to move that cart around. That's what I like so much about this cart and it's got loops to hold the tools. So you can push or pull that cart. If you're sitting on it, you can actually use that long handle kind of as a rudder and just use your feet to shuffle you along so you don't have to stand up, move the cart, sit down, stand up, move the cart, sit down. You can use that to steer. The next one over is, uh, looks like a red tractor seat. It's on a, it's red metal. It's on a red base that has four pretty good sized wheels and it's got a basket underneath of it, like a tray. It's a hard seat with no cushioning and no backrest. And I can tell you from personal experience, you have to crouch over it and push on the seat to move it around, which is not something you wanna do even at your home. But when you're at the actual farm science review and you need to go about a block over and pass several hundred people as you're trying to get from your Ohio AgriBuildy exhibit tent to the Utzinger Garden gazebo to take this cart and use it in your demo, you don't wanna be crouched over a, a cart for that long pushing it. So that cart has never actually made it to the Utzinger demo gazebo at least not with me. So if I was going to get a work seat it would be that black one with the handle. The next things we have are two different garden carts. So there's a gray one. It's a wood gray cart. It's got great big tires that would be I guess near the front of it that look like bicycle tires. And then on the the operator end of it, side of it I guess is the back, it has feet. So it comes down and kind of has a u-shaped foot. So it's not just posts like you might see in a wheelbarrow. It's a nice foot that's going to give you a lot of stability. It's got a flat bed, fairly high sides. And if you'll notice that panel that's at the front, you could pull that up. And then it's got a, I'll call that a U shape or I guess a D shaped handle coming out from the, from the back towards where the operator is. And it comes off the, the bed of the cart. Why that's nice is you can hold it for two different ways. You could hold it with your hands, with the back of your hands facing up and your, your knuckles facing towards the front of the cart, or you could hold it with your hands at the side, more of in a neutral position um, on the side of the handle. So the backs of your hands would be facing out to the side and your fingers would be facing inside. That could also not only be easier to, to push like that, it's gonna be really stable because it's got those two front wheels and the two back legs. So I don't have a picture of a wheelbarrow here, but when I was growing up, we had horses and you have to clean out horse stalls when you have horses. We had a wheelbarrow that had a single front wheel and two legs, and that thing was so unsteady. And if you tipped it at all, it all fell out. And then you not only had to have cleaned up the stall, you had to clean up all that horse manure again into the wheelbarrow. This thing is much nicer. And that front panel is really nice because if you filled it with, with mulch or soil or whatever, you would fill the cart, take it out to where you want it, and you could just pull up your that front panel and just rake it or shovel it or even tilt it and dump it out. It would save you a lot of effort. It's also 95 pounds and it can carry up to 400 pounds. So if you were going to purchase a cart like this, I would suggest you go to um, our local nursery is Oakland Nursery. So I would go to Oakland Nursery. I would find the cart that I wanted to try and then I would 
push it around the nursery and I would also fill it with the things that I'm likely to be hauling. So if I'm going to have three 20 pound bags of soil, I'm going to put three 20 pound, 20 pound bags of soil in there and see if I really can push, pull, manipulate it. Just to make sure because these are not inexpensive. Um, they're listed on our garden handout, a few hundred dollars probably. So I want to make sure I can use that just because it can carry 400 pounds, it doesn't mean I need to carry 400 pounds in it. The last one on this um, page is a green garden cart. It's green and it's made out of vinyl, like a suitcase vinyl. It has four wheels. They're a little bit smaller, but they're nice and wide. Has a handle. It looks like a kid's little red wagon, except made out of vinyl. Um, it has a bed on it and it has pockets that hang over each side. And those side flaps have pockets in them so you could put tools in. You may not be able to see it, but the corners are not sealed. Um, you can kind of see by the, the handle of the wagon, there is a shovel handle sticking out. And then at the other end, there's a shovel blade sticking out. So you can put longer tools in um, from corner to corner. It weighs 21 pounds. The sides fold down and it carries up to 150 pounds. So another thing I like about that little green wagon is I don't have a garden shed. I, have, I live in a condo and we have a two car garage that's really full between the cars and all of our stuff. I would not be able to store that big gray cart, but if that green one folded down, I could probably make that work. So we've talked about equipment and supply, hauling it. Now we're gonna think about how you store it. So uh, first I've got a video here of one of our OT friends and she is gonna show how to lift things off of a shelf and put them down lower. Again, we're back to the safe lifting, but one of the things I would say about those garden carts you have, I want you to notice before I get to the video, in the center of the picture is a um, metal four shelf, a set of, more, set of shelves, four metal shelves. Um, I have some of these, I have some four and five shelves. These things are great. And those shelf heights are adjustable. So if I did have a garden cart, I would make sure that one of my shelves, either the one of the middle shelves was at the same height as that garden cart. So that if I had something heavy on it, I could have it sitting on the shelf. I would have to put it there, but then when I wanted to take it out or use it, I'd pull my garden cart up to it and pull that heavy object straight off into the garden cart. I wouldn't have to pick it up and put it there. I could just pull it, which is less effort. So here we've got her here and so that's Sammy or Leah and they're going to show us how to take the bucket off the higher shelf and then sit it on the lower one. Just another safe lifting demo. Right. So she's picking up the bucket. She's being very careful to not twist. She followed it with her nose and toes, picked it up and just moved it over to the table. So if you could put the table right up next to it and slide it over, that's good too. Otherwise do it like that, but always remember the nose and toes when you're lifting things. Got another picture on here. It's a gray, um, looks like a bench trunk. It's very similar to the brown trunk that I had a couple slides ago. Slides ago. It is, um, it's a bench, it has a back and arms and then a lid that closes and you can store things inside it. So you can see inside this one, it's got, looks like a flower basket with some tools and towels in it, maybe a watering can and some seat cushions. So that'd be nice to put out in your garden. You could have those things out there if you wanted to just sit and relax or take a rest break while you're gardening, but also so that you could store some things that you wouldn't have to haul back and forth to the garden. My last picture on here is the really pretty picture of, it's got a um, metal mailbox and it's kind of worn, it's like a kind of a worn gray and it's on a post and it's standing in the middle of a bunch of bushes and then there's another, um, it's like a fence post and you can kind of see the road. The reason I put this mailbox here, I had done this presentation a few years ago and someone had said that their neighbor had taken an old mailbox and put it in the garden. And then they kept small hand tools and spray bottles and things in the garden. So if they walked down the driveway and went to get the mail or whatever, they could stop at the little mailbox in the garden, take out some tools and do some work. And I thought that was so clever because it's very picturesque. And also it's a great way to just leave a few small tools out there that you can just stop on an impulse and do some gardening and you don't have to bring your things back and forth. 
So you may have noticed a theme. I'm encouraging you not to carry your things back and forth to the garden unless you have to. Uh, the less effort you have to expend getting your stuff out to the garden, the more effort you have to expend gardening. So next I want to talk about container, raised beds, and vertical gardening. These can be easier on your back and knees. So if you have trouble kneeling, crouching, um, bending over, stooping over, these are all some great ways. Also, like I said, I live in a condo. We have a flower bed in front, flower bed around the side, and then we have a very small patio in the back. So we use some vertical gardens. I have a lot of pots hanging on our the back rail of our steps and also hanging around the perimeter of our patio because vertical gardening and container gardening works very well for me. Unfortunately, I don't have room for a raised bed, but next place we get, we're gonna have a real garden. So the picture on the left is, these are all from Franklin Park Conservatory again. You can see some different types of raised beds. There are some that are um, like just a couple of boards, maybe, I don't know, two by fours, two by sixes, something. Um, built into a rectangle. So the, the plants are maybe a foot off the ground so you don't have to bend down as far and you really could sit on the edge of these but then you'd be twisting a lot to reach into them. There's some really big pots with some different plants in them so that's great for container gardening. We have a couple of raised beds that are maybe a couple more feet high. They have feet. They're a little easier to get to. If you were using a wheelchair mobility device they'd be a really good height for you to work in. The center picture, we got a picture of my husband here. He's at one of the Franklin Park um, raised beds. They were very gracious when they saw him reaching into their gardens, which they knew he wasn't supposed to do. He wasn't really doing anything to him. He was just demonstrating, but they were very nice to let him do that. But he's standing next to some plants and um, you can see he's about five foot 10 and it hits him right around waist height. So he's not crouching over. It's a very comfortable height for him to work in while standing. And then in the last picture, he's standing in front of a vertical garden. Um, the base of it's a couple feet high. It's got some nice plants in it. And then they have kind of a trellis frame. It's um, a big square frame and it has, I think, oh, that's not chicken wire, but some real wide wire, the kind of fencing that's big wide squares and it has sunflowers growing out of it. So it doesn't take up much space. I would be surprised if it's, it might be 30, maybe a yard deep, two and a half feet deep, and probably five or six feet long. But it doesn't take up a lot of space and it has a lot of sunflowers. So you've got the, the flowers growing around the base of it and then the height. So vertical garden like that doesn't take up an awful lot of space. So next. So our next slide we're going to show my husband, he's actually working at a raised bed. Um, raised beds should be two and a half to three feet high with leg room so that if you're using a wheelchair or a scooter or something, you can get right up to it. Pull up to it like you're at a dinner table, but you could pull up to it so that your legs could go under the table. You should be able to reach the back or middle of the bed while seated or standing. So if you had a bed, you don't want to make it too, um, wide. Yeah, I guess that's wide. Because you want to be able to comfortably reach into the middle of it. If you make it too, if you make it too wide, you have to lean over and reach and that can be really uncomfortable. Um, now, Barack is standing at that tall bed that we had before. He was kneeling down next to it, looking in the base of it. And now he's looking at the sunflowers, which are nice and tall. But it really, really is a nice, really nice setup with those raised beds. So planning for next year, I love perennials. I have pictures here. Those are some of my grape hyacinths and tulips and my soon to be blooming Asiatic lilies. Well, they're not blooming this year, they're done, but they're beautiful. But those are my perennials. I love perennials. I love easy to care for plants. I don't have an irrigation system and I'm, I envy anyone who does, but I like soaker hoses and bungee hoses. And then built-in storage and seeding. So now we're coming through kind of the harvest season of our garden. Um, if you're a great gardener, you're probably gonna keep planting and growing well until the winter starts. 
but when you're planning on it for next year, think about some things that can add in some sight and sound and scent landmarks. Think about ways that you can make some universal design implement implementations into your garden so that you can keep gardening, gardening longer, gardening safely, and putting less effort into maintaining particular structures and rather just going in and enjoying and working. I also suggest as I said, built-in storage and seating, because it's nice to be able to just sit in the garden and enjoy the, what you've done, and inviting people to help you in the garden. There's nothing wrong with delegating. I'm a big fan of delegating. So ask people to help you out in the garden, and that's nice too. For more information, you can go to our website, agribility, which is spelled A-G-R-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y dot O-S-U, dot edu backslash resources backslash webinars hyphen and hyphen handouts hyphen 2020 or just go to the agribility.osu.edu page click on the resources link we'll have um, resources we have fact sheets we have a lot of different handouts we'll have farm science review materials we have caregiver support materials in there a lot of great information. Again, for this one, I have handouts for stretching, the garden equipment handout, as well as an outline of this presentation. And we have links to other recorded webinars there. We also have 32 Ohio AgriBuilding fact sheets, which are under the resources tab on the AgriBuilding website. Some of our topics are gardening with a physical limitation, secondary injury prevention, heat stress, and universal design on the farm. Thank you for joining us today and happy and healthy gardening. For more information, you can contact me, Laura Ackerman. My number is 614-292-0622. And my email is A-K-G-E-R-M-A-N dot four at O-S-U dot E-D-U. And I wanna say a special thanks to Leah and Samantha, two occupational therapy students who helped us out with those videos. I'd like to thank Meg Tiford, Professor Emeritus from the OSU School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. She's helped with videos, consultation, and she and I have presented together on this topic a few times and I always enjoy presenting with her. And I gotta say it's a thrill because I took a class or two from her back in grad school and it's quite a thrill to get to present with your professor. And last of all, I'd like to thank Leah Schwinn, Doctor of Occupational Therapy, and Andrew Kramer, Masters of Public Health, for creating our Fitness for Farm Life Train the Trainer program, which has videos, webinars, and fact sheets. And last of all, I have to thank my husband, Barack Ackerman, for being such a good sport, going out, digging through gardens, going to agritourism sites, and helping me out with this so much. I really appreciate it. And again, I thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it.